So um, the main application that is currently available is cross-chain fungible token transfers. So you can take a token from one blockchain and you can send it over to the other blockchain. So if we were just to think about kind of these two chains talking and wanting to transfer these tokens, we need to kind of understand what sort of that process might look like. So just thinking about it naively, you have this token, so you probably want to lock it up on one chain, and then you want to be able to represent it on the other chain after that lockup occurs. But the other chain needs to know at some point that the first chain actually locked up the token. Otherwise, it doesn't want to just start creating tokens willy-nilly and kind of printing them out of air. So in order to do that, we need to be able to prove things about the first blockchain. But then you run into this question, well, how do you know like how to represent this blockchain? How do we understand it? Where do we start proving things from? Um, and so at this point, you kind of need kind of a root of trust to start from. And to do these sort of proofs, we're going to leverage things called light clients, which you may have, may have heard of, which are kind of sparse representations of a blockchain. So normally when you have like Bitcoin, you have a block, then you have the next block, the next block, the next block. But a light client is going to make it so we're able to have like this first block, but then maybe we skip like 12 blocks and we go to that uh, 12 ahead. And then we do the same thing, but maybe we skip like 20 blocks or something like that. So the light client allows us to kind of keep a history of this blockchain, but without needing all of the space requirements normally required to track a blockchain with a full node. So this is kind of the application. And when you look at everything that's involved, right, you have this sort of application logic, but then you need to kind of prove things about this application logic. And you need to start from somewhere with that proof. And you need to have a lot of information about the other chain kind of what consensus algorithm it's running. And so once you start looking at this, you realize, well, maybe we can just take a step back and generalize all of this. We can kind of have applications. Then we can have a lot of like proof stuff. And then at the very bottom, we can have like specific information about these chains. And so that's the division that occurs with IBC. And it's modeled off uh, TCP. So it kind of takes that in the design of doing it. But so now that we've kind of looked at the general requirements for IBC and taking an application, uh, putting it in the mold of IBC, but also making sure IBC can handle any application so we don't have to redesign it every time, uh, we can look at the structure bottom up. So there's two ways of doing sort of inter-blockchain communication. You can do it bottom up or you can do it top down. And sharding is more of a top-down approach where you have like this manager or some coordinator, which will keep track of all the different blockchains and they all report to that coordinator. And then you can know everything is in synchrony. IBC does it in a bit more of an asynchronous approach by having things be bottom up. And at the first level, we have what are called IBC clients, which are light client algorithms. So we kind of take a light client implementation, but we only care about the algorithm portion. And this will allow us to do things like proof verification and keeping track of that blockchain and its blocks. And so we designed this IBC client into two parts. We have what's called the client state, and we have a consensus state. The client state contains all the sort of like parameters you need to do the verification. So since light clients only track certain blocks of a chain, it has very specific security guarantees. And these security guarantees need to be encoded into this client state so that we can do this verification and users can understand sort of what guarantees they're getting from this light client. Then the consensus state is mapped to with a height. So a consensus state is really a block but it's a lighter version of a block because it only contains the necessary information we need to verify from one block to the next. So the consensus state, it really only has the hash of the validator of the, the next block and um, the root hash for the tendermint. So it's pretty light. It's, it, it 
only has those two things, the validator set and then kind of the hash of the last block. And so those are the two components of like an IBC client. But if we want to take a step back, we realize, well, not all the chains we're going to be talking to are Tendermint clients or Tendermint chains, not based on the Tendermint algorithm, right? We may want to eventually talk to Ethereum or Polkadot and all these chains, which might have different consensus algorithms and therefore different light clients. So this first level of IBC, the clients, isn't a specifically Tendermint clients. It's any sort of blockchain which can have a light client in general. But the first implementation contains Tendermint clients, another client which is called the Solo Machine, which is really just like a public key and a private key pair, um, and kind of like a proof of authority blockchain. And so those are the two first clients we're working with, but we're working to get other clients along there. But each chain would just be responsible for having this IBC client and having it implement our client state interface and the consensus state interface and kind of proof functions that go along with that. So at a high level, that's the first layer. Now, now that we have things that, so um, to give more context on a light client, light clients verify things. They verify things about a chain and they can jump from one block to the next. And so um, because they can verify a block, they can verify transactions that were included in a block. So our light clients are tracking another chain. So let's say we have the hub and um, we have Ethereum. So the hub on its blockchain, it would have an IBC client, which represents the Ethereum blockchain. So if there is a transaction included on the Ethereum blockchain, I should be able to prove that on the IBC client on the hub that that transaction was included. So now that we have things that can prove state about the other blockchain, we kind of want to work our way up because at the beginning I said we need to be able to start from somewhere, right? We need to have some sort of root of trust and then we need to work from there and kind of go through steps to make sure that both blockchains are on the same page when they're communicating with each other. So this next level, this next layer of IBC is called connections. And connections is primarily a useful abstraction to contain information about IBC that um, we, specifically about the IBC protocol and information that allows us to kind of establish a connection in the very beginning and then utilize that connection to do a bunch of application stuff. Um, and we kind of use that abstraction so we make a connection once, but then we can establish a bunch of different applications on top of that. And this connection goes through what's called a connection handshake. So when two chains want to talk to each other, they need to kind of meet each other, interact, shake hands, and agree upon some terms. And so this handshake is modeled off the TCP handshake, and it's divided into four steps. There's kind of the init, which is the initialization of like a connection. And this can kind of be um, the same as like saying like hello to someone for the first time. And then there's the try, which is this kind of response to someone saying hello. And that's like, I, I have gotten your hello and I'm saying hello back. Then there's this ACK, which is someone saying, I have now seen that you have responded to my hello. And then there's in confirm, which is seeing that someone has done the ACK. So a typical handshake might be like, um, hello, I am the Cosmos Hub. Then Ethereum might be like, hello, Cosmos Hub, I am Ethereum. Then the Cosmos Hub would be like, it's really nice to meet you, Ethereum. And then uh, Ethereum would be like, it's also nice to meet you, Cosmos Hub. And that would complete the handshake. They're, they went through those four steps. And we need these four steps because when the Cosmos Hub says hello, it needs to know that Ethereum has gotten its message and that it's on the same page and that it's able to speak the same language and use the same vocabulary. And 
when Ethereum gets the Cosmos Hub hello, it also needs that same reassurance that when it says hello back, that the Cosmos Hub is actually speaking English at that time. And so that kind of, that's why we need the ACK in the open confirm. There's some more details about the handshake where some of these steps can be performed um, like at the same time. So both the hub and Ethereum could accidentally say to hello to each other for the first time, but you can still work through the handshakes. You just have some uh, duplication there. So once the connection handshake is established, we have information sort of about like what language we're speaking. So we're speaking IBC. Maybe we even have some sort of version. So we're speaking like IBC version one, or maybe we're speaking IBC version two. And we also um, want to do things like verify. So during the connection handshake, a very important step is that when there's kind of these responses to the hellos or the nice to meet you, there is this verification where the hub would want to check that the IBC client Ethereum has for the hub is actually what the hub considers a valid client for itself. So the hub can say, um, this is the IBC client I'm imagining for myself. It has sort of this height, it has this chain ID, it has this unbonding period, and this kind of like set of chain parameters. And it, during this connection handshake, it wants to make sure that Ethereum is actually correctly representing the hub and that it's not, it doesn't think it's like talking to someone else. So there's this verification that, that occurs in the connection that the hub knows that Ethereum is talking to the hub and Ethereum knows that the hub is talking to Ethereum. Once we are able to establish this connection where we understand the counterparty and we know that they understand us, then we can start moving to what are called channels, which are the next layer above that. Now channels is where we have our applications. So channels have a channel ID and a port ID. The channel ID just uniquely identifies its channel and the port ID specifies which application we're talking about here. Kind of what, what application are we doing? So for the cross-chain transfers, the port ID is typically transfer. And this allows us to do a mapping from a channel to some application code. So channels will facilitate things called packets. So this is sort of when we get into more of the communication side of things. So if I want to talk to Ethereum and I want to send tokens, I need to send data to the other chain. And that is going to be done through a packet. And the packet will contain useful information for kind of processes, processing that packet. So like the uh, channel and port it's coming from and the channel and port it's going to. But it also contain application data, um, which is opaque. So it's just a stream of bytes that are being transferred in this packet, which represents the application. And the application on the receiving side is responsible for being able to decode those bytes and actually take some useful action on top of it. So channels will do this routing where a user or a module says, I have this packet and I wanna send it to this other chain. Here are the channel ID and the port I'm sending from and here's the channel ID in the port I'm sending to. And usually the module will do some sort of authentication on this packet. So if I'm sending a transfer from the hub to Ethereum, there's the transfer module, which will actually make sure that the user, the account, the balance is being sent from, that the user who signed the message is actually, uh, actually has that balance and actually owns the account. So the uh, channel layer will kind of process this packet and it will create what's called a packet commitment. So a big part of IBC is its design philosophy, which is to kind of be minimalistic. And um, this is represented in multiple ways, such as using a light client as opposed to like a full node on chain for tracking the blocks. So we only track a sparse set of blocks instead of every single one. And the other way it's minimalistic here is by having a packet commitment, which is not the packet, 
it's the hash of the pack of specific parts of the packet, primarily the data and the timestamp and the sequence. And so basically what's occurring here is a user says, hello hub, I want to send this, these tokens to Ethereum and um, this is my balance and it will create a packet for it and it will take a hash of this packet and it will store this hash in its own state under some sort of key. And this key usually has the channel ID and the port ID and the sequence of the packet. And this is all uh, known and specified and agreed upon um, beforehand. And so now what's occurring is the hub is saying, I have received this, uh, like someone on my chain has created this packet. I've received it. I have processed its application information, such as locking up tokens in escrow. And I am committing to it. And I'm saying that because I have processed this packet, it should be received on the other end by Ethereum. And so this hash gets stored into the state and the hub produces a block with that. And so now we have sent a packet essentially. And what needs to happen is we need to receive that packet and we need to have it go from the hub all the way to Ethereum. And then Ethereum needs to process it. 